and we are back for prepping for winter with the Mercy sample chapter. Arya is in Bravos after having a wolf dream of being on the hunt. Through the dense concealing fog, Arya heads to the gate, which is performing The Bloody Hand, a story based on the life of Tyrion being shown to impress an envoy from Westeros. Arya has taken on the identity of Mercy, an actress and stagehand, and so she assists the other actors getting ready. This includes Bobono, the dwarf playing Tyrion, in a parallel to Penny helping Tyrion over in Slaver's Bay. All the while, we wonder why Arya has been sent to the gate by the House of Black and White. And so let's continue. The pit was as full as ever she'd seen it, and they were enjoying themselves already, joking and jostling, eating and drinking. She saw a peddler selling chunks of cheese, ripping them off the wheel with his finger whenever he found a buyer. A woman had a bag of wrinkled apples. Skins of wine were being passed from hand to hand. Some girls were selling kisses, and one sailor was playing the sea pipes. The sad-eyed little man called Quill stood in the back, come to see what he could steal for one of his own plays. Cosimo the Conjurer had come as well, and on his arm was Ina, the one-eyed whore from the Happy Port. But Mercy could not know those two, and they would not know Mercy. So here we get a bit of atmosphere with people selling various products. Women openly sell kisses, showing the Bravosi's lax attitude about relations, and notably, a woman sells a bag of wrinkled apples. Now, apples are often harvested in the autumn, so it shouldn't be too unusual to see apples as winter has only recently come to the world, but these apples are wrinkled, meaning they're old. These apples have clearly been imported from someplace far away that grows apples. Bravos, it seems, is not a good place to grow fruit. Now, curiously enough, Arya spots three characters from her life as Cat of the Canals. There's Quill, a patron of the Happy Port who writes plays for the ship. There's Cosimo the Conjurer, another patron of the Happy Port who teaches Arya sleight of hand. And there's Ina, a sex worker from the Happy Port. Arya assumes that Quill is there to steal ideas, while Cosmo and Ina are just having a night out, it seems. Now, I will say the presence of these characters is awfully suspicious, especially that of Cosmo. It should be noted that Arya was assigned to her life as Cat of the Canals, and the patrons of the Happy Port would teach her skills that appeared quite useful to a faceless man. Red Rogo, for example, would teach her how to use her finger knife, while Cosmo would teach her sleight of hand. These are skills Arya employs later on as the ugly little girl. Considering how useful these characters were, it would seem that at least some patrons of the Happy Port were in fact servants of the many-faced god. And Cosimo, our man in question, has oddly arrived with one-eyed Ina at the play. Of course, no one needs to bring a sex worker on a date, and Ina is not exactly arm candy. The Happy Port brothel only has bargain sex workers, and Ina is specifically said to be unattractive. Not to mention, one wonders how Cosimo, a not very good magician who relies on bargain sex workers for his company, would find the money to spend on an evening for the theater for two, and why he would shell out this cash. It seems much more likely that Cosimo is there to check up on Arya. Now, Arya doesn't think these characters will recognize her, but Arya used her own face for Cat of the Canals and her own face for Mercy. Besides her wig and dress, there doesn't seem to be much hiding her identity. Dana recognized some gate regulars in the crowd and pointed them out for her. The dyer Delono, with his pinched white face and mottled purple hands. Galio, the sausage maker, in his greasy leather apron. Tall Tomorrow, with his pet rat on his shoulder. Tomorrow best not let Galio see that rat, Dana warned. That's the only meat he puts in them sausages, I hear. Mercy covered her mouth and laughed. So next, Dana finds it necessary to point out some of the gate's regulars. There's Delono, a dyer, perhaps the same dyer who dyed Bobono's fake penis. There's Galio, the sausage maker, and Tall Tomorrow with his pet rat. These men appear to be working class merchants, fitting in with the in-between economic status of the gate. Now, the presence of these three on one level may remind us of the revenge-filled tale of the rat cook. We have a pinched, white-faced character, a rat, and the butchering of clandestine meat. But on another level, and much more significantly, the presence of Delono is notable as he is a dyer with stained hands. He would almost certainly remind Arya of her old friend Lamy Greenhands. Lamy's hands were modeled green because of his dyeing work, just as Delono's are modeled purple. And Lamy Greenhands was of course murdered by Raph the Sweetling, earning Raph a place on Arya's death list. And it is Raph who Arya spots and seeks out further on in this chapter. 
And so it's more than a bit striking that a dire is pointed out to Arya, and this is done right before she sees Lamy's murderer. On a side note, the Hound also once refers to the Mountain's men, including Raph, as Gregor's pet rats, something Tamaro has brought with him to the play, though this may only be a coincidence. But with regard to Dana pointing out Delono, one must wonder if the identification of a dire with modeled hands is by chance or if it was intentional. The eventual conflict and resolution of this chapter does seem a bit contrived. Arya even thinks that the events are so lucky that it's divine intervention. We should remember that the House of Black and White knows about Arya's death list. They asked her about it, and they know Raph the Sweetling is on it. And the House of Black and White are the ones who put Arya at the gate. If Arya running into Raph the Sweetling after being reminded of Lamy Greenhands is not luck, it would seem the House of Black and White would be the culprits. The balconies were filling too. The first and third levels were for merchants and captains and other respectable folk. The bravos preferred the fourth and highest, where the seats were cheapest. It was a riot of bright color up there, while down below more somber shades held sway. The second balcony was cut up into private boxes, where the mighty could comport themselves in comfort and privacy, safely apart from the vulgarity above and below. They had the best view of the stage, and servants to bring them food, wine, cushions, whatever they might desire. It was rare to find the second balcony more than half full at the gate. Such of the mighty who relished a night of mummery were more inclined to visit the dome or the blue lantern, where the offerings were considered subtler and more poetic. So next we have yet another passage on the class structure of Bravos and the gate's place in it. We are told that the upper class, dressed somberly, prefer the dome and the blue lantern, but the gate has a floor for the rich as well, which pulls in some rich on regular nights and many rich tonight. We hear of the middle class, captains and merchants on the first and third balconies, the poor would be down in the pit, and on the fourth floor we have the bravos, poor young men who dress colorfully, who kill each other in the street at night. I'm not actually sure how bravos survive, I suppose as bodyguards in a parallel to hedge knights in Westeros. Over and over in our story, the segregation of bravos has been highlighted, the two harbors, the ways of dress, the different balconies, a mirror of Westerosi segregation between highborn and lowborn. The upper class has easy access to food, wine, comfort, and sex, with the lower class struggling. This night was different, though, no doubt on account of the Westerosi envoy. In one box sat three scions of Utharis, each accompanied by a famous courtesan. Prestain sat alone, a man so ancient that you wondered how he ever reached his seat. Tyrone and Prinellis shared a box, as they shared an uncomfortable alliance. The third sword was hosting a half-dozen friends. So next we hear about a few powerful people who are attending the play. First, there are three members of a house called Otharis. Now curiously, there is another house, House Otharis. This is the house that the courtesan the Black Pearl is from. Now, we aren't sure if this is a mistake and there's actually only one house, or if these are two separate houses with very similar names. Regardless, the three Otharis are important enough to have a box, but not important enough to be named. We know that there are five key holders in the audience, so it may be that one of the Otharis is a key holder, but probably not all three. But even if none of the three are key holders, the crew would certainly know more senior key holder Otharis. We also hear about an old Prestain, the apparent patriarch of House Prestain. The Prestains seem to be a very powerful house. When Arya passed through the city in the Cat of the Canals chapter, she mentions the towers of Prestain and Antarian. The Sea Lord happens to be an Antarian, and this house seems to be on the same level of status. We also hear about a tradesman captain named Moreto Prestain in the Cat of the Canals chapter, but this character is almost certainly someone more powerful. It's a safe bet that Prestain is one of the five key holders in attendance. We then hear about Tyrone and Prinellis, who share a box and an alliance. We know nothing of this relationship, but apparently there are sensitive issues about. These two have a conflict, but are willing to come together because of some other larger issue. With these two being named, it is likely that they are important enough to be key holders. And we hear about the third sort of Bravos, a protector and likely informant of the Sea Lord and his house Antarian, though we know little about this third sword. All in all, we have representation from at least six important Bravosi houses. Othares, Prestain, Tyrone, Prinellis, Antarian, and Rayanne, who we will hear about next. I count five key holders, said Dana. Pissarro's so fat you ought to count him twice, Mercy replied, giggling. 
Isambaro had a belly on him, but compared to Bissaro, he was lithe as a willow. The keyholder was so big he needed a special seat, thrice the size of a common chair. They're all fat, them Rayans, Dana said. Bellies as big as their ships. You should have seen the father. He made this one look small. One time he was summoned to the Hall of Truth to vote, but when he stepped onto his barge, it sank. And so here Dana tells us that in the audience tonight there are five key holders. That is, people with stakes in the Iron Bank who elect the Sea Lord of Bravos. Now we know one key holder by name, the Sorrow Rayan, a morbidly obese man, and we are fairly certain that Prestain is a key holder, and probably also Tyrone, Prinellis, and perhaps one of the Otharis. Now, there are over 1,000 keyholders, so five keyholders out of 1,000 doesn't seem like too many. But we should keep in mind that each of these men are part of larger houses with more keyholders in their ranks. Prestain, for example, seems to be a patriarch with influence over, say, Moreto Prestain. Not to mention, these are likely the same keyholders representing the Iron Bank in their talks with Harry Swift. They're likely senior keyholders with quite a bit of sway. And this is all relevant not just because of the talks between the Iron Bank and the Iron Throne, but also because of the upcoming election for the new Sea Lord of Bravos. Now, curiously, when Dana speaks of Bassaro Rian, she mentions that his father's ship suspiciously sank with him during his vote. Dana jokes that it was because he was too fat, but these are barges, huge ships, so that's exceedingly unlikely. Still, it's striking that a barge sank during a vote, either killing the elder Rayan or preventing him from casting his vote. It shows that people do try to interfere in the elections of Bravos in sinister ways. And as it happens, we have another election coming up. She clutched Mercy by the elbow. Look, the Sea Lord's box! The Sea Lord had never visited the gate, but Isambaro named a box for him anyway, the largest and most opulent in the house. That must be the Westerasi envoy. Have you ever seen such clothes on an old man? And look, he's brought the black pearl. The envoy was slight and balding, with a funny gray wisp of a beard growing from his chin. His cloak was yellow velvet, and his breeches. His doublet was a blue so bright it almost made Mercy's eyes water. Upon his breast, a shield had been embroidered in yellow thread, and on the shield was a proud blue rooster, picked out in lapis lazuli. One of his guards helped him to his seat, while two others stood behind him in the back of the box. And so here is our reveal that the Westerasi envoy is in fact Harry Swift. The man's appearance matches that given for Harry Swift and Cersei IV of Feast for Crows, unathletic, balding, and using a small beard to hide the fact that he's chinless. And of course, he's wearing the swift sigil, a blue rooster upon yellow. Interestingly, Arya's eyes water when she looks upon the sigil, though she blames it on its brightness. I do wonder if perhaps Arya is being emotional for a moment after seeing the sigil. When she last saw the sigil of House Swift, it was at Harrenhal during Tywin and the Mountain's men rule in A Clash of Kings. Now interestingly, Dana thinks that Harry Swift looks funny because he's old and wearing colorful clothing. Bravos are the ones that wear colorful clothes in Bravos, and they tend to be on the young side. Now Harry Swift is in Bravos by a bit of an accident. Cersei made him Hand of the King in A Feast for Crows as a hostage to keep her uncle Kevin in line. Harry is Kevin's father-in-law. She later moves him to the position of Lord Treasurer or Master of Coin when she wants Orton Merriweather to be Hand. And so when Kevin takes over after Cersei's arrest, he needs to treat with the Iron Bank of Bravos, and so Harry's being master of coin, is sent to Bravos. So with Harry Swift is the Black Pearl, the famous courtesan, who we will talk about in a moment. Now here again we see it's Dana suspiciously guiding Arya's eyes. She earlier directed Arya to look at the dire Delono, who would almost certainly remind her of Lamy Greenhands. And now she's directed Arya's gaze to a box where Raph the Sweetling, one of Harry's guards, happens to be. The woman with him could not have been more than a third his age. She was so lovely that the lamp seemed to burn brighter when she passed. She had dressed in a low-cut gown of pale yellow silk, startling against the light brown of her skin. Her black hair was bound up in a net of spun gold, and a jet and gold necklace brushed up against the top of her full breasts. As they watched, she leaned close to the envoy and whispered something in his ear that made him laugh. They should call her the Brown Pearl, Mercy said to Dana. She's more brown than black. The first black pearl was black as a pot of ink, said Dana. She was a pirate queen, 
fathered by a sea lord's son on a princess from the Summer Isles. A dragon king from Westeros took her for his lover. So next we get some background on the Black Pearl, the most famous of courtesans. Now, the Black Pearl is a character that quite a bit of time has been spent on describing, though we aren't sure why or how she's important. Even here, the focus on her seems a bit forced and out of place. We actually first hear about the Black Pearl in the second Arya chapter of A Feast for Crows, and then in Cat of the Canals. In that chapter, a sex worker named Mary gives some background on her, which the kindly man later amends at the House of Black and White. And here, Dana gives even more information on her. And on top of hearing about the current Black Pearl, people also seem to bring up the first Black Pearl a bit as well. On a side note, there is some history on the first Black Pearl given in the World of Ice and Fire, though this information contradicts the books, and George R. Martin has said that the novels trump the World of Ice and Fire on this issue, and in general. So here Dana tells us that a Sea Lord's son and a Summer Islander princess had the first Black Pearl, and that Black Pearl was a pirate queen. And in A Feast for Crows, the kindly man mentions that the current Black Pearl shares the same name as the first Black Pearl. They are both Belaguer Otheris. Now, repeating history as a huge theme in Ice and Fire, and names are often part of this theme, as if a namesake can somehow influence the actions of a character. Rhaegar names his children for the Conquerors, Daenerys and Quentin speak of the first Daenerys, Nan tells Bran that the Night's King may have been a Brandon as well, and there are dozens of examples of this in the story. And so because of this repeating history theme, it's perhaps relevant to know who the first Belaguer was, as her actions may echo in the second Belaguer. And what we mainly know the first Black Pearl for is being the mistress of Aegon the Unworthy. And so we must wonder if there's any possibility that the current Black Pearl would be a mistress of young Griff. Though as the story is currently going, it doesn't seem likely. Another significant thing about the first Black Pearl is the fact that she had children with Aegon the Unworthy, and so her offspring, being part Targaryen, may have special genetics that allow them to hatch or ride dragons. Even without these potential abilities, House Otheris may have sympathy for a Targaryen cause as their ancestors were Targaryens, and this may be a factor in how their key holders may vote in the upcoming election. We know in Braavos, slavery and dragons are serious political issues, and young Griff is supported by a slaver, while Daenerys utilizes dragons. Another thing that's interesting about the Black Pearl is the similarity in her ancestry to Brown Ben Plum. Brown Ben tells us that he's part Bravosi, Summer Islander, Ibanese, Cahoric, Dornish, Dothraki, Westerosi, and Targaryen, by a princess. He then proceeds to fill in the family tree sum by telling us that his mother was Dothraki and his grandmother half Ibanese and half Cahoric and we can assume the patrilineal line is Westerosi from House Plum. This leaves the remaining ethnicities as Bravosi, Summer Islander, Targaryen, and Dornish, and three of those ethnicities would describe the offspring of the first Black Pearl. Now Tyrion assumes Brown Ben descends from Viserys Plum, the possible child of Aegon the Unworthy and his sister Elena, but we never get any confirmation on that. It would be interesting if Tyrion were wrong, and Brown Ben is actually descended from Aegon the Unworthy and the first Black Pearl. After all, the daughter of Aegon the Unworthy and the pirate queen Black Pearl could also be considered a Targaryen princess. And it's notable that Arya thinks the Black Pearl should actually be called the Brown Pearl. Now, regarding skin tone, there is a curious side note on this. The first Black Pearl is described as being black as ink, despite being only half Summer Islander. Ice and Fire is actually a bit inconsistent in describing the skin tone of Summer Islanders. Victarion, a seasoned sailor who's been around, describes Summer Islanders as nut brown, while those from the Basilisk Isles are described as black as ink. However, Cersei thinks Jalabar Zo, a Summer Islander at court, is black as ink, and Sam thinks Koja Mo is jet black. So it seems our author can't decide on what Summer Islanders look like, Though, it would be fun to think that some of those Summer Islanders out there are being impersonated by Basilisk Islanders. And this is a good place to stop. We'll continue on in Mercy Part 7. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.